Eyes Kayla all morning my sisters and I had waited around the house, so when our father finally walked in the door, we raced to him, crying, Poppy. Poppy. Mommy held a finger to her lips. The baby, she reminded us, but Poppy forgot himself and picked each one of us up with a shout and gave us a twirl. The chauffeur waited patiently at the door, a bag in each hand. In the study, Mario, Poppy directed. Then he rubbed his hands together and said, do I have a wonderful surprise for my girls. What is it? We all cried, and I took a guess because last night at prayers mommy had promised that one day I would see such a thing. Snow. Now, girls, remember, mommy said, and though I thought she meant baby Fifi again, she added, let Poppy relax first. Then mommy whispered something to Poppy in English, and he nodded his head. After dinner then, he said, we'll see who leaves her plate clean. But when our faces fell, he rallied us, J, I, I. What a surprise. 256. Sandy and Yo-Yo exchanged triumphant looks and skipped off, hand in hand, to tell our cousins next door that Poppy was back with a wonderful surprise from New York City, where it was winter and the snow fell from heaven to earth like the Bible's little pieces of manna bread. But I was not about to wander off, for supposing, just supposing, Poppy finished his drink and decided to open his bags right then. As the only one there, I'd get first pick of whatever the surprise was. If only he would give me a tiny clue. But my father was no good for clues. He was sprawled beside my mother, his arms spread out across the back of the couch as if he were about to embrace everything that was his. They were talking in those preoccupied voices that grown-ups use when something has gone wrong. Prices have skyrocketed, he was saying. My mother ran her hand through his hair and said, my poor dear, and off they went to their bedroom for a nap before dinner. The house grew quiet and lonesome. I lingered by the coffee table, taking sips from what was left in the glasses until the ice cubes rattled down to my mouth, tattletales, and I had to squeeze my eyes shut with the burn of Poppy's highball. From down the hall came the sound of tinkling silverware and the scrape of a chair being settled in its place. Then Gladys, the new pantry maid, began to sing, Yo Tyro La Cachara, Yo Tyro El Tender Yo Tyro to Lo Plato M Voy Pa Nueva Yo Backslash. I loved to hear Gladys's high, sweet voice imitating her favorite singers on the radio. Someday, she was going to be a famous actress, Gladys said. But my mother said Gladys was only a country girl who didn't know any better than to sing popular tunes in the house and wear her kinky hair in rollers all week long then comb it out for Sunday mass and hairdos copied from American magazines my mother had thrown out. Gladys's singing stopped abruptly when I entered the dining room. I, Carla, what a scare you gave me, girl. She laughed. She was setting the table for dinner, taking spoons from a bouquet of silverware in her left hand, executing fancy dance steps before stopping at each placement and reminding herself, spoon on the right, wife to the knife. In the absence of sisters or best friend cousins, Gladys was fun to be around. She stood back from the table and cocked her head critically, then tucked a chair in, gave a knife a little nudge like someone straightening a straight picture on the wall. She nodded towards the back of the house. I followed her through the pantry, where everything was in readiness for dinner, the empty platters were out, waiting to be filled, the serving spoons were lined up like a family, tall ones first, then littler and littler ones. In the passageway that connected the maid's room with the rest of the house, Gladys stopped and held open the door. So. Your father is back from New York. I bowed my head with pleasure and entered past Gladys. The maid's room was dark and hot. Most of the windows had been shut against the fierce, mid-afternoon Caribbean sun. A hazy, muted light fell from a high, half-opened window. On a cane stool, a humming fan turned this way and that. Slowly. As my eyes adjusted to the dimmer light of the room, I made out the plastic statuettes and holy pictures of saints which cluttered the bureau top. An old mayonnaise jar with a slit in the bottle cap glinted with the coppery dregs of a few pennies. As the fan blew upon it, the flame of the votary candle swayed and flickered. Two of the three cots were occupied. On one, the old cook, Chucha, lay, fast asleep, her fat black face looking pleased at the occasional cool breeze. On another sat Navia in her slip, head bowed, murmuring over a rosary as if she were finding fault with the beads that dangled between her knees. As the door clicked shut, Chucha opened one eye, then closed it. I hoped she had fallen back to sleep, since the old cook liked to scold. 
In fact, old Chucha was growing so difficult that mommy had decided to build a room just for her. You know your mother doesn't like you back here, Chucha started in. I looked to Gladys to defend me. No harm, cook, Gladys said cheerfully. She led me to her cot and patted a spot beside her. Dona Laura won't mind today, seeing as Don Carlos just got in. Tell me the hen doesn't peck when the rooster crows, said Chucha with heavy sarcasm. She let out a grumpy sigh and turned herself over to face the wall. Softly, the fan tickled the pink bottoms of her feet. I was changing Dona Laura's diapers before you were born, she quarreled. I should know how the dog bites, how the bee stings. Gladys rolled her eyes at me as if to say, don't mind cook. Then she said in an appeasing voice, you certainly have put your time in. 32 years. Chucha let out a dry laugh. I wonder where I'll be in 32 years slash Gladys mused. A glazed look came across her face, she smiled. New York, she said dreamily and began to sing the refrain from the popular New York merengue that was on the radio night and day. Dream on slash Chucha said. And now she was laughing. The fat under her uniform jiggled. Her body rocked back and forth. Your head is in the clouds, girl. Watch out for the thunderbolt. I, cook. Gladys reached over and gently patted the old woman's feet. She seemed as unfazed by Chucha's merriment as her bad temper. Every night I pray slash she said, nodding towards the makeshift altar. Gladys had once explained to me how each saint on her bureau had a specialty. Santa Clara was good for eyesight. San Martin was a jackpot, good for money. Our blessed mother was good for anything. Now she picked out a postcard my mother had thrown out a few days before. It was a photo of a robed woman with a sharp star for a halo and a torch in her upraised hand. Behind her was a fairytale city twinkling with Christmas lights. This one is a powerful American virgin. Gladys handed me the card. She'll get me to New York, you'll see. Speaking of New York, Navia began. She hurried her sign of the cross and kissed the crucifix on her rosary. Navia, the latest of our laundry maids, was black black, my mother always said it twice to darken the color to full, matching strength. She'd been nicknamed Navia after an American face cream her mother used to rub on her, hoping the milky white applications would lighten her baby's black skin. The whites of the eyes she now trained on me were the only place where the cream magic seemed to have worked. Show us what your father brought you. Lucky, lucky slash Navia continued before I could explain. These girls are so lucky. What a father. He doesn't go on a trip that he doesn't bring back a treasure for them. She enumerated for Gladys, who had been working for us only a month, all the treasures L Doctor had brought his girls. You know those dancing dolls from the last time. I nodded. One thing you never did was correct Navia and risk being called a young Miss Know-It-All. But the dancing dolls were from two trips back. From the very last trip, the gift had been tie shoes that were good for our feet, a very bad choice, but that's what came of my mother's being in charge of what the surprise would be. Before he left on each trip, my father always asked, Mommy, what do the girls need? Sometimes, as with this trip, Mommy replied, not a thing. They're all set for school. And then, oh then, the surprises were bound to be wonderful, because as Poppy explained to Mommy, I didn't have the faintest idea what to get them. So I went to Swartz, and the sales girl suggested. And off would come the wrappers from three suggested dancing dolls or three suggested pairs of roller skates or this very night, three wonderful surprises. Gladys took the postcard back and smiled at it. What did your father bring you, she asked. Not yet. I let out a sigh, disappointed that I couldn't oblige their curiosity, for even Chucha had given half a roll over to hear what the surprise had been. We have to eat our supper first. Speaking of supper, Navia said, reminding the two others. Our work is never done. Then she added, night and day, and what surprise do we get? She grumbled on as she braided her kinky black hair into dozens of tiny braids. Her complaints were different from Chucha's. They were bitter and snuck up on you even during the nicest conversations. Chuchas were a daily litany, sometimes cried out at the dog, sometimes scolded at the rice kettle she had to scrub, sometimes mumbled under her breath at Dona Laura, whose diapers she had changed and whose actions, therefore, she had a right to criticize. Supper that night was spaghetti and meatballs, thank goodness, so it wasn't difficult to clean one's plate. 
I spooled the strands on my fork and rolled my two mud balls around until I got tired of that, and ate them both. Mommy was in a good mood, letting the baby go off with the nursemaid, Milagros. Usually mommy insisted the baby stay, bawling in her high chair, so the family could have one official meal together like, civilized people. Tonight the family were spared the torments of civilization, and of vegetables, for mommy allowed us to serve ourselves, which I did, just enough peas to go around my neck in a necklace, had they been strung together. My sisters and I ate quietly, listening with wonder to our father's stories about taxis and bad snowstorms, how could a snowstorm be bad, and the Christmas decorations on the streets. We felt the blessedness of the weeks ahead, this very night, a wonderful surprise, and in less than 20 days, according to the little calendar with doors we opened with mommy every night at prayers, Christmas. And more surprises then. We were lucky girls, Navia was right, oh so lucky. Finally, Poppy turned to Gladys, who was pushing the roll away. Card around the table, clearing off the plates. Hey Gladys, mommy reminded him, after all, she was the new girl and Poppy had not had much occasion to use her name. Gladys, Poppy asked. Would you bring me my briefcase? In the study, mommy directed. On the desk next to the smoking table. Away Gladys hurried, her slippers frantically clacking, delighted to be sent on such an important errand, then she was back, his leather briefcase cradled like the baby in her arms. Good girl. Poppy gave Gladys a bright, approving smile and snapped open the locks. The lid flew up like a jack-in-the-box. Inside were three packages, wrapped up in white tissue paper, and clustered together in a tender, intimate way like eggs in a nest. Poppy handed one to each of us and then lifted a tiny box from the side pocket of the case and smiled at my mother. You dear. Mommy patted his hand. She opened the box, pulled out a doll-sized perfume bottle, undid the stopper and smelled. This is the one all right. You know, I never did find the old bottle. But you remembered, even without the name. She leaned over and kissed Poppy's cheek. There was the sound of ripping paper and Poppy cheering us on, I a e, I, I. Gladys lingered by her cart, organizing the dirty dishes, slowly, into neat stacks before rolling them away to the kitchen where Navia and Chucha would wash them. But once we'd torn open the boxes, my sisters, and I gave each other baffled looks. Mommy leaned over and lifted a small cast iron statue from Yo-Yo's box, an old man sat in a boat looking down at a menacing whale, its jaws hinged open. Sandy set hers on the table and tried to look pleased, it also was an iron statue of a little girl with her jump rope frozen midair. I didn't even bother to unpack mine. I stared down at a girl in a blue and white nightgown who stared up at a puffy canopy of clouds. What could the Swartz sales girl have been thinking of this time? What on earth are they, Poppy? Mommy asked, picking up Sandy's little jump roper and looking into the dotted eyes. Guess. Poppy smiled coyly, then added, they're all the craze now. The girl at Swartz said she'd sold half a dozen already that day. Mommy turned the statue over and read out loud from the underside, made in the USA. Then she noted a keyhole for a tiny key. Why she looked up at Poppy, it's a bank, isn't it? My father beamed. He took the jump rope girl and set her down on the table before him. She stood poised on her stand, an arc of wire rose over her head and looped through two needle holes in her fists. The polka dots on her dress and the yellow in her hair had been painted on the iron. Watch this, he said, picking a penny from the pile of change he had rattled on the table. The coin fit in a groove on a fence post beside the girl. Poppy pulled a lever at the base of the stand, the lever popped back in, the coin dropped with a tinkle and tap, and then all of us my sisters and mommy and Gladys and I blinked, for the girl took a skip and the jump rope turned a turn. A sigh of wonder passed around the room. Mechanical banks. Poppy grinned and picked another penny from the pile. So that my girls start saving their money to take care of us, mommy, he gave her a wink, when we're old and gray. Do mine, Yo-Yo begged, and Poppy placed a penny in the old. Man's slotted hands so that the coin looked like the wheel of a boat. When he pulled the lever, the sailor turned and the coin rolled into the whale's mouth. My sisters and I burst out laughing. Jonah's bank, mommy said, reading the name on the side of the boat, and then with a look of mischief in her eye, she said, I, Lolo, I wonder what the sisters would say to that. Poppy's eyebrows rose up. Wait till you see this one. He laughed, lifting my bank out of its box.
Actually, these Jonah and Mary banks are supposed to encourage the children to save for their offerings at church. Surely the sisters can't object to that. He stood a penny in a slot on the canopy of cloud and pulled the lever at the base. The coin disappeared, the young woman, her halo painted on her hair, rose up towards the clouds, her arms lifted at the joints of the shoulders. As the lever popped back in, she descended to the ground. Blessed mother! Gladys whispered. Then everyone, including my mother, laughed because we had forgotten Gladys was still in the room, and there she was, neck craned forward, her eyes as round and coppery as those very pennies that had worked such wonders. Poppy held up a coin to her. Here, Gladys, give her a spin. But Gladys backed off and looked shyly at her slippers. Go on, my mother encouraged her, and this time she came forward, wiping her hands on her apron, and took the coin from my father, who directed her to stand it on the cloud. Again the coin rattled down, and Mary ascended for a moment, then fell back to earth until the next penny saved. Gladys's face was radiant. She made a slow, dazed sign of the cross. They're like children slash my father said tenderly when Gladys left the room. Did you see her face? It's as if she had seen the real thing. After dinner as my parents gossiped over their expressos and cigarettes, my sisters, and I shared a disappointed look. I tried giving my Mary a shake to see if I couldn't get the pennies out and buy myself a box of chiclets. No, 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 Carlita. They stay in there saved. My father patted his pocket. Poppy keeps the keys. The banks turned out not to be such a disappointment after all. They were far better than tie shoes, that was certain. At school they created a stir among the other children. The most popular girls in my class elbowed each other in line to stand next to me. They invited me to help myself to my favorite red lifesaver when it was the next one unwound from its wrapper in the roll, and even when it wasn't the next one, several were collapsed to get to it. Sister read Dona Laura's note explaining that this was an offertory bank, and everyone got to work a penny in the cloud and watch the little figure rise. Then sister, whose job it was to make a lesson out of everything fun, told our class how our blessed virgin did not die but got to take her body to heaven, she was so good. The class gazed dreamily at the bank, half expecting it to shoot up to the ceiling in a puff of smoke. I took my bank back home heavy with coins. My father unlocked the bottom and out came a few less than a hundred pennies, and he kindly made up the difference and gave me a big silver dollar that looked more like jewelry than money. Then business slowed. Once in a while, my mother's canasta. Friends, who declared they hated pennies in their purses, disposed of them gladly in the whale's mouth or the canopy of cloud. Of course, the jump rope girl was the favorite, Lucky Sandy. But Gladys protested that the best one of all was the Mary Bank, and she used up all the pennies in her mayonnaise jar to work the miracle. The pity was it didn't take quarters. Eventually, the banks found their way to the toy shelf along with all our other neglected toys. Christmas was coming. My mother complained that she would die of exhaustion there was so much to be done. Our pageant costumes had to be sewn. Next door Tia Issa needed help getting the garden and house ready for the big Christmas night bash to be held there this year on account of this was her first divorced Christmas, and she should be kept busy. Then the grape tree had to be cut down at the seashore, painted white, and hung with silver and gold balls and showered with tinsel. What a sight. Especially at night when mommy turned off all the lamps and the tree blazed with lights, blinking on, off, little vials like the stoppers of Nose drops filled first with colored water and then drained out. As the day approached, with fewer and fewer windows to open on the advent calendar, my sisters and I were unruly with excitement, but the grown-ups seemed too busy to care. The house was fixed up as for a party. The giant poinsettias in the courtyard looked like flaming torches. Nuts and fruits filled the silver platters at the centerpieces of tables and sideboard. An elegant soldier took an almond in his mouth and cracked it open for you, and every time he did so, my mother sighed and said, it's a pity there's no national ballet for the girls. Gladys was busier than ever, polishing silver, preparing canapes, fall. Lowing her mistress through the house with vases of calla lilies and bougainvillea. Instead of the radio merengues, Gladys now sang an endless repertoire of Christmas carols, aria. Best of all, mommy seemed not to mind the singing anymore and once or twice broke out into song herself in a delicate 
Quavari Soprano, a Santa Claus El Gusta El Vino, a Santa Claus El Gusta El Ion. And, of course, at the Christmas Eve pageant, all the children sang, adsts Fidel's Laity's Triumphants. I, costumed in a nightgown with a tinsel crown on my head, was to announce to the poor shepherds tending their flocks by night, do not be afraid for behold I bring you tidings of great joy, the baby Jesus is born. But I was so flustered by the lights in my eyes and the sea of faces in the packed auditorium that I stumbled over my lines and said, the baby doll is born, instead of, the baby Jesus. Mommy said no one but she, who knew I wanted a baby doll from the baby Jesus, had caught the slip. The next morning the baby doll was under the tree, a ribbon in her gold hair, and a bottle tied to her wrist. She cried out mama when I laid her down and wet her diaper after she drank a bottle through a little hole in her mouth. And that was not all. The room was a treasure cave of gift-wrapped boxes. Something for everyone, Poppy said, laughing. And a lot for his darlings. Each one of us sat at the center of a pile of ripped paper and empty boxes and gaily colored toys. Even the baby had her sizable pile, though she preferred crawling about, ripping up paper, and putting the shreds in her mouth while poor Milagros scrambled after, scolding that no charge of hers was going to choke and die on the very day our savior had been born. All the servants were there, Mario and Chucha and Navia and Gladys, opening their gifts carefully so as not to tear the bright tissue paper. Their faces lit up, a wallet with a pretty lip of green in the billfold. That night, although I had got to bed much later than usual, I couldn't sleep. Even when I shut my eyes tightly in an honest effort, I saw now my new doll, now my puzzle or coloring book loom larger than life in my vision, and I had to turn on my light and look at my gifts to make sure they were real. Mommy came by briefly from the noisy party next door in a long, silvery gown, her pale arms bare, one arm linked to Tio Mundo's arm. She wagged her finger at me for having my light on, but she didn't seem to mind really, and she laughed a lot when my uncle shot himself dead several times with Yo-Yo's new revolver. Much later, Gladys stopped in on her way back. From helping out next door. It's past midnight, young lady. But instead of turning out the light, she sat herself down on my bed, took off her slippers, and began massaging her tired feet. We could hear the uncles and aunts and mommy and poppy singing carols in the distance. It's a gay old time next door, Gladys said. Dona Laura had danced a bolero with Don Carlos that was as good as in the movies. Don Mundo had taken off his shirt and done a workman's jig on top of the dining room table. Crazy Dona Isa had been thrown or threw herself into the swimming pool, you couldn't be sure. Gladys's gaze wandered around the room, taking in the clutter of new toys before alighting fondly on the shelf. A hopeful look came on her face. From her pocket she brought out her new wallet, opened it and withdrew the 10 pesos from the fold. I'll buy the bank from you, she said in a hesitant voice. The bank? Why that old thing was certainly not worth 10 brand new pesos. Not since the gadget had gotten rusty from its being left out in the patio overnight. Half the time the spring didn't work at all. Why, Gladys, no, I advised her. Gladys' gaze faltered. She put the bill back in the fold and held the wallet out. I'll throw in the wallet too. For a moment, I didn't know how being good worked. Most times, mommy was around, telling me the rules, you weren't supposed to give away gifts you received. Gladys should keep her wallet. But that meant I should keep that old bank, which to give away would be a generous deed. Muddled, I looked up at the shelf. You can have it for nothing, I said. Gladys's mouth dropped. Open. The surprised look in the young maid's eyes confirmed my suspicion that I had done something I would get punished for if caught, so I added, don't tell, Gladys, okay. The maid nodded eagerly as she left the room, the bank bundled in her apron and tucked under her arm. But mommy was one to always notice the stain on one's placemat at the table or the bruise accidentally punched on a little cousin's arm or the empty space on the bedroom toy shelf. That reminds me, my mother said a few weeks after New Year's when the whole household had been mobilized to look for her reading glasses on top of her head. Where's your merry bank, Carla? Just then, as Gladys and I exchanged a guilty look, mommy found her glasses on her head and slipped them down on her nose. She looked curiously from me to Gladys. My bank? I asked, as if I'd never heard of such a thing. Come, come, my mother said, and again she looked at me and again she looked at Gladys. Ah, that bank, I answered, 
and explained that it was around. Mommy was very patient and said nicely, well, let's find it, shall we? And when we didn't, of course, find it anywhere in my room although I gave a very credible, thoroughgoing search, looking even inside my tie shoes mommy did not per Sist but let the matter drop. That Sunday after the maids went off to early mass, my mother inspected their quarters while my father kept watch by a window. Later, I heard my parents concerned voices behind the closed door of the study. Then the door flew open. And my father came down the hall, followed by my scowling mother, and just in time, I ducked behind the wicker chair as they went by. Then they were back again in a somber single file, my father, a grumbling chucha, and my mother bringing up the rear. The same procession went back and forth with Navia, then Milagros, and last of all, with Gladys, her eyes small and round. The door shut. Voices were raised in the study. I watched a powder puff of dust turn cartwheels in a cross breeze. In the corner, a shred of tinsel glimmered with leftover holiday cheer. Finally, the door flew open, and Gladys, sobbing into her upraised skirt, scurried down the hall. My heart sank. Trouble was brewing in the big house. It had already landed on Gladys, and there was no use hiding, for sooner or later, it would fall on me too. I rose and lay the doll on the cushion of the chair, ignoring its cry of mama. At the door of the study I paused, overcome as always by the high shelves packed with books like a library and the dark wood of the walls and jalousies. My mother was pacing up and down the room, as if neither direction would do, and smoking steadily. My father sat at the edge of his recliner, his hands drooped over the armrests, his head bowed. On the small smoking table beside the stand of pipes, I caught sight of the mechanical bank, swaddled in an apron. I took a step into the room. But no one noticed me. It was a present, I blurted out. My mother stopped in her tracks and looked at me absently. I gave it to her, I confessed. My father looked up at me, then exchanged a glance with my mother. Next time your father brings you a gift, my mother began to scold, but Poppy cut her off. We're just going to have to get better presents, mommy, he said, winking at me. I don't see the dancing dolls being left out in the rain or given away to the maid. My heart soared at the thought of a better surprise than any that had come before. What could it be? I looked about the room expansively for ideas, anything, anything. My gaze fell on the bank. My mother put out her cigarette with little, nervous jabs. I guess I better go explain to the others. She sighed and brushed past me. The door slammed shut behind her. A rack of pipes jiggled and rattled. A whole wall of jalousies collapsed open. Out in the driveway Mario had pulled the car up to the entrance. He went inside the house and a little later came out carrying a cardboard box and several sacks he placed in the back seat. Gladys followed, a kerchief on her head to keep her church hairdo in place, dabbing at her eyes with another kerchief. She climbed in beside her bags, and with a blinding flash from the chrome Mario polished all day long, the car disappeared down the driveway, past the guard at the gate, to the world. Poppy, I cried, turning around. Don't make Gladys go away, please. My father reached out and pulled me towards his lap. His eyes were dull as if they'd been colored in brown and smudged. We can't trust her, he began, but then he seemed to think better of explaining it that way. It was Gladys who asked to leave, you know. She'll get a job in no time. Maybe even. End up in New York. But the glum look on his face did not convince me. He gazed past me, out the window. The distant sound of a car engine died into a hum. His glance fell on the little bank. He smiled and reached in his pocket, withdrawing pennies. Give her a spin, he said. I was not in the mood for play. But my father seemed sad too, and it was up to me to cheer him up. I picked up a penny from his hand, stood it in its slot and pulled the knob as far as it would go. The coin dropped with a clink to the bank below. The lever jammed and would not slide back in its groove. The little figure rose, her arms swiveled. Then she stopped, stuck, halfway up, halfway down. The drum yo-yo it was a drum Mamita brought back from a trip to New York, a magnificent drum, its sides bright red, crisscrossed by gold wire held down by gold button heads, its top and bottom white. It had a broad blue strap with a pad for putting around your neck, the flat top facing up, for it was a drum roller's drum. Mamita presented me with it, slipping the strap over my head, lifting the top up. 
Ha, I sighed, for in the hollow at the center, two drumsticks were stored. She took them out, tapped the top down, and handed me the drumsticks. Though her palm had given the first tap, she would not rob me of the thunder of the first wicked drumstick drum roll. Barabam, barabam, bara 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 bam. Ah my grandmother rolled her eyes, another Beethoven. What do you say to your grandmother? Mommy asked proudly. Bara 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 boom. 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 275. Yo yo, my mother cried out, and I stopped drumming abruptly so that she yelled out into the suddenly silent room, that's quite enough. Laura, my grandmother said, scowling at her daughter. Why are you yelling at the child? Mamita, I said nicely, thank you. Thank you is bear, put butter on my bread, my mother snapped. Thank you very much, I buttered. And then, I brought down an apocalyptic, apoplectic, joy to the great world drum roll that made Mamita throw her head back and laugh her loud, girlish laugh. My mother plugged a finger in each ear like Hans at the dike, a great flood of scolding about to come out of her mouth, which I held back by drum roll until she snatched the sticks out of my hands and said she would keep them until I was responsible enough to play my drum like an adult. I forgot all the promises I had made before being given the drum to improve my character and wailed. I wanted them back. I wanted them back. Mamita intervened, and the sticks were put back into the hollow of the drum, and another promise extracted from me that I would not play the drum inside the house but only out in the yard. My grandmother pulled me towards her. She had once been, so mommy said, the most beautiful woman in the country. We called her Mamita, little mother, because she was smaller than mommy, with the delicate face of a girl, brown doe eyes and white wavy hair in a bun that sometimes fell down her back. In a braid. She looked like a girl who had had a terrible fright that had turned her hair white. That drum is from a magic store, she said, consoling me. Oh, my mother said casually, wanting to rejoin the conversation. Where did you get it? Swartz, Mamita said. FAO Swartz. And she promised that one day soon, very soon, if I behaved myself and didn't drive my mother insane with my drum and drank my milk down to the bottom of the glass and brushed up and down instead of across and didn't get into things like lipsticks and perfumes and then pretended as I walked through the house reeking of Paris with a J-E-N-E-S-A-S paw look on my face that I did not know what could have happened to the little bottle with a bow tie, she, my favorite grandmother, would take me from the island to the United States on an airplane to see Swartz. And the snow. And at this, I could not help myself, but having tipped the lid up and kidnapped the drumsticks, I gave a modest, tippy-tap, well-behaved drum roll that made Mamita wink and Mommy smile and both agree that in the last five minutes I had indeed grown up to responsible drumming. B.A. Bam, B.A. Bam, I tapped about the yard all day. That was just like my mother to let me have a drum and then forbid me to drum it, B.A. Bam, B.A. Bam, in any significantly inspired way. And how could I judge significance in a drum unless at least one grown-up clapped her hands over her ears? And how could I judge inspiration unless there was noise in it, drumming from my ten flexed toes, from my skinny legs that would someday improve themselves, drumming from the hips I swayed when I was womanish, and up, up the rib cage, where the heart sat like a crimson drum itself among ivory drumsticks, and then the drumming rose like wings, making my shoulders shrug. My arms lift, my wrists flick, and down came the drumsticks, boom, boom, barabier, boom. Yolanda Altagracia, you forget yourself, came my mother's curtsy when you say hello voice, her puree of peas voice. We have a fine yard that lots of other children would give their right arms to play in. And so it was that for a whole day, I marched in front of the hibiscus and saluted the bougainvillea and drummed until the mockingbirds were ready to fly off to the United States of America in the middle of December. All that week and the next and the next and the next, I drummed up and down, up and down, up and down the yard. Then, with the terrible luck of such toys, I lost one drumstick. And then, our crazy aunt, Tia Isa, who was unhappily married to an American and always on the point of divorcing and who, therefore, never looked where she was going, plopped herself down on my second drumstick and snapped it in two and glued it with glue that would, she promised, hold a house together. But I never believed glue could hold drumsticks together, however good it was on china cups and porcelain shepherdesses and all such grown-up truck that was always finding its shattering way to the floor in my presence. 
And so it was that in less than a month's time, I had a drum but no drumsticks. Mamita and Mommy and Tia Isa, not understanding that drumsticks are the only kind of drumsticks that will do on a drum, suggested pencils or the handles of wooden spoons used for making cake batter. I tried them all, but the sound was not the same, and the joy went out of drumming. I took to wearing the strap across my chest, the drum riding my hips like a desperado's revolver. In those days we had a fine yard that lots of other children would have given their right arms to play in. Beyond the laundry room at the back of the house, the lawns rolled away, so smooth and closely mown, the ground itself seemed green rather than planted with grass. At the back of the property was a shed where the coal bins were kept for the laundry fires for boiling the white clothes, a shed known to be haunted. In those days it was an adventure to go into the coal shed and stare down the big barrels of coal bricks and breathe in coal dust, to then pluck up your courage and turn an empty barrel over, spilling the devil out, to race all the way to the back of the house, to scramble up the back steps to the laundry room where one-eyed Pila would cock her head and say, What? Is the devil after you, child? That old laundry maid, Pila, was the strangest maid we had ever had, for it seemed everything that could go wrong with her had gone wrong. She had lost an eye, her left, let's see, or was it her right? You never knew. The two eyes took turns staring fixedly at the sky. But what's an eye? A little bit of jelly with a duplicate beside it. Who'd notice a missing eye in the face of her incredible skin? She had splashes of pinkish white all up and down her dark brown arms and legs. The face itself had been spared, it was uniformly brown, the brown skin so smooth that it looked as if it'd been ironed with a hot iron. Only around the eyes where the tip of the iron couldn't get to were their wrinkles from smiles. She was Haitian, though obviously, only half. The light-skinned Dominican maids feared her, for Haiti was synonymous with voodoo. She was a curiosity and I, a curious child, I, with the promise of snow in my heart and the wonder of the world seizing me with such fury at times that I had to touch forbidden china cups or throttle a little cousin or pet a dog's head so strenuously that he looked as if he were coming out of the birth canal, I wanted nothing more than to get a temporary injunction from politeness and have a good long stare at her speckled arms. As I was saying, the coal shed was haunted. And it was Pila's doing. There was a time before Pila when the coal shed was just a coal shed. But then Pila came, and in addition to five paper sacks of her things, she brought her story devils and story ghosts and her trances and her being mounted by spirits and her, I see a nimbus about your head, beware of water today. All these spirits, she claimed, lived in the coal shed. And so it was that by the time of my drum, the coal shed was haunted. By the time of the drum, I should also add, Pila was gone. She had lasted a couple of months at the compound before disappearing one Sunday. The house was thrown into mathematical turmoil. The linens were counted. The clothes inventoried. The other maids and mommy put two and two together, and the sum was that now for almost two months we had been living with a thief. Pity for her, my mother said, she won't get far with that skin. Sure enough, the next day she was picked up by the police. By then, having consulted her American education, my mother decided it would be cruel to press charges. The poor woman didn't know any better. Let her and her ten shopping bags go. And she was gone, leaving behind a whole coal shed of devils and goblins, so that by the time of my missing drumsticks, to dare enter the coal shed was quite literally to be a daredevil. The day I wandered into the coal shed looking for trouble I had the drum on my hip and two little dowels for drumsticks. Pila had been gone several weeks. In I went pushing the door back so the hinges cried out, devils, their thumbs crushed, their pointed noses tweezed. I stood a moment in the doorway, blinded by the shaft of light that struck like a knife blade into the darkness. Slowly, I made out the barrels, eight or nine standing, a couple tipped over. I crunched coal bricks underfoot. I dared further. I stood at the end of the shaft of light, and then one toe braved the darkness. My heart was pounding. I leaned over the first upright barrel and peered in, half expecting to look down a long well into the devil's eye. Nothing but coal bricks at the half mark. In the next barrel, coal bricks at the quarter mark, then dregs of coal bricks. The new laundry maid, Nivea, was using them up inefficiently, without a system. The last barrel was tucked behind the others. I looked down at a full barrel. Suddenly, there was a little stirring, a whimper, a little pink mouth opened in a yawn, 
so pink and moist was that mouth it seemed impossible in a coal barrel. The mouth closed, another one opened, a cry came out of it, meow. Two or three mouths wailed in chorus, meow, meow. Immediately, I singled out one who had four little white paws and a white spot between its ears, fully dressed, so it looked, as opposed to the others who were careless and had lost their shoes. And their caps. This one, a curiosity, was the one I intended for me. But I did not touch her or pet her or touch or pet any of the brothers and sisters. At that time, my natural lore was comprised of a few rules, all of which I confused so that when the situation presented itself, I knew there was something to be done, but I did not quite know what exactly. If it was lightning, I was either to stand under a tree or in an open field so the tree wouldn't fall on me. If I found a nest of nightingale eggs or chicks, I was not to disturb it or the mother would abandon her roost and the chicks would die. But was it chickens or kittens? I wasn't sure. Vaguely, too, I remembered a horror story about a mother cat being vicious and scratching out the eyes of someone who had threatened her babies. I did not want to find out the hard way the dose and don'ts of kittens. I needed, therefore, to question an adult who might know everything, and between lightning and chickens, I could slip in a question on kittens. But whom could I ask who would know about kittens? And whom could I ask who would be sure to know about kittens but would not suspect my secret? Mommy in the house was bad on both counts, Mamita wouldn't know anything about the outdoors, which she was allergic to, she claimed, which was why. She had to go on shopping trips to New York, where, she said, the outdoors wasn't really outdoors, a riddle I promised myself someday to solve. Tia Isa was no good to ask either, she'd laugh her hooping laugh and scurry around and peep and meow, pretending to be a chicken and nightingale and kitten, all in. One, until the whole extended family would guess what I was up to, and Pila, who knew about everything on this earth and out of it, Pila was, of course, gone. Unsure of what to do but knowing if I stayed there debating my options, the mother cat might well come and blind me, I left the coal shack and lingered about the yard. In my exasperation, I lifted the lid of my drum and was about to take my dowels out and drum a racket louder than I had ever drummed, when I saw a man I had never seen, crossing our yard towards the orchard of wild orange trees that stretched beyond our fence. A dog accompanied him, or rather, the dog ran ahead, slowed, sniffed the ground, gave a bark, chased a butterfly, and in a dozen other ways, made the world safe for the man. The man was a dashing, handsome, storybook kind of man, dressed in jodhpurs and riding boots. He had a goatee and a mustache, which made me wonder if he weren't the devil, and a way of addressing the dog with affection and humor, which convinced me he wasn't. He had not seen me and was passing not more than ten yards away when the dog twisted about, raised his nose, and curled one paw up. The man stopped and looked up at the sky. It was then I noticed he was carrying a gun on a shoulder strap, the barrel pointed up. The dog began to bark. There, there, the man said, addressing the dog. Where are your manners? Then he turned to me. The ends of his mustache lifted in a smile. Good day, little miss. I hope Kashtanka did not frighten you. I eyed the man, his gun, the dog now poking his nose where dogs always poke their noses on a person. With a child's instinct, I knew the man was safe, for occasionally, Strangers my grandfather had met on his travels came for a visit and wandered over to our property. But I was uneasy that a dog was loose and there were kittens, seven mouthfuls, nearby in the shed. The dog sniffed my drum. I say, the man said, what have you got there? It's a drum, I said, bringing it round from my hip to in front. Of me, but I've lost the drumsticks. And I lifted the top and tilted the drum so he could look in at the two dowels. I've got to use those, and the sound is not the same. It never is, the man agreed, to his great credit. He crouched down beside his dog. His riding boots creaked. About drumsticks, I said. And then, because I was sure I had found my man, I hurried my questions, can you play with a brand new kitten or will the mother abandon it or blind you if she catches you and by when can you take a kitten from its mother to keep as a pet? Well, the man said, looking at me closely but with friendliness in his eyes. About drumsticks, eh? Well, just as your drumsticks belong inside your drum, and dowels will not do, so a kitten belongs with its mother, and no one else will do. But pets, I protested, glancing at Kashtanka. 
The man's hand fell fondly on his dog's head. Pets are a different matter, to be sure. But the little creature must be old enough to survive without its mother, he concluded, rising. Just as he was rising, Koshtanka made a dash forward. The man snatched his collar and pulled the dog back so his front paws were still treading the air. Drumsticks, eh? The man laughed at something over my shoulder. I turned around and saw a large black mother cat, her teats pink and sagging, slinking into the coal shed. Koshtanka barked excitedly. The cat scurried in. Your manners, Koshtanka, the man said, giving the collar a jerk. The dog healed, whining quietly to show that his feelings were hurt. About drumsticks, the man said, winking one eye so long I wondered if, like Pilaz, his wasn't real. Either. While a kitten is still a suckling, it cannot, now can it, be taken from its mother to be a pet. I had to agree. To take it away would be. The man considered his words. To take it away would be a violation of its natural right to live. The man saw I did not understand him. It would die, he said plainly. So you must wait, he added, petting my hair so that Koshtanka gave me a jealous look, you must wait until that kitten can make it on its own. Don't you agree? I looked over my shoulder at the coal shed. The man went on. I would say in a week, and that's one, two, three is Sunday, seven is Thursday, by Thursday I should think a kitten, even if born this very day, a kitten might be ready to belong to a fine young lady with a drum. I drummed my fingers on my drum, one, three, five, seven is Thursday. That's a fine drum, the man observed, and a good, sturdy strap. Just then, a flock of birds flew overhead. The dog looked up and let out an excited yelp. We're off, the man announced. And off they were, before I could count to seven, down the lawn to a creaky wicker gate, through which they entered the orchard and disappeared among the trees. One, two, ba bam, three is Sunday. The mother cat had gone into the coal shed to feed her kittens. Ba bam. Mine was the best dressed one. I would name her Swartz. Seven is less than the fingers of two hands, but seven was seven more than now, and as if to confirm my addition, I heard the thunderous report of the man's gun in the distance. There was a clatter from the coal shed and, moments later, the mother cat dashed across the yard, flushed out by the noise of the gun. While the coast was clear, I decided to re-enter the coal shed and tell Swartz of our plan for next Thursday. I walked in, looked over the brim of the coal barrel. Swartz was meowing in terror. There, there, I comforted her. But there, there would not do. I picked her up and whispered in the sweet little seashell ears, there, there. I brought her down to my shoulder and burped her and put her in the crook of my arm and tickled her belly and poked my fingers under her arms, and she meowed that that was fun, that I should do it again. And there, there, I did. It was Friday and it would not be Thursday for another seven days. I had every intention of putting her back. But then, call it coincidence, call it plot, the man's gun went off again in the distance, and I realized he was in the orange grove hunting. Hunting. Some of the birds he was aiming at this very moment were mothers with worms for their babies. I did not know at the time the word for saying one thing and doing another, but I did know plenty of practicing adults, and I was not going to be gypped of a well-dressed kitten by a moral imperative given. To me by an exception to the rule. Out of the shed I strode with Swartz clapped on my shoulder. She meowed out goodbyes to her brothers and sisters as we crossed the yard. Suddenly, I stopped. Up ahead sat the fat black mother cat enjoying the warm sun on her fat black back, licking a paw as if there were cake batter on it. She had not seen me, but I knew it was a matter of moments before Swartz's meowing reached her. In that instant the vague memory sharp. And. I saw a cat slinking forward. I saw it crouch to spring. I saw it leap and land on a woman's face. I saw its claws rip out an eye. I saw that jelly spill and I remembered suddenly with shocking clarity Pila recounting how she had lost her eye. Slowly, my left hand patting Swartz to encourage a hiatus in her meowing, I worked the top off my drum with my right hand. Swartz's mother put down one paw, lifted another, and began to lick it. I picked Swartz up, and in one deft movement, plunked her down into the hollow of my drum, grabbing up my drumsticks in exchange, slapping the lid down, shifting the drum in front of me, and then as the mother cat jerked around and caught sight of me and then of my drum, 
which was meowing furiously, I brought down aloud, distracting drum roll, bara 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 boom boom. Meow, bara boom. Meow. Meow. Boom boom boom, meow. I marched straight towards the house, lifting my knees high like a major et. The baffled mother cat looked at me uncertainly and followed at a cautious distance, meowing. The drum meowed back. I drummed madly. My heart was drumming. And then, as the cat gained on me, I broke into a med run, scrambled up the back steps, slammed shut the back door that led through the laundry room to the house. A deep sink full of soaking whites told that the new washerwoman had stepped out only for a moment. Backed against the wall, I spied out. The window. The mother cat prowled in front of the door. She stopped, smelled the ground. Swartz, she meowed. Swartz meowed feverishly from inside the drum. The mother glanced all about her, at the door, at the sky, but she could not find where the sound was coming from. Swartz. Where are you, she meowed. Thunder, thunder. The gun thundered. The mother cat bolted away. I picked the meowing kitten out of my drum. Its little human face winced with meows. I detested the accusing sound of meow. I wanted to dunk it into the sink and make its meowing stop. Instead, I lifted the screen and threw the meowing ball out the window. I heard it land with a thud, saw it moments later, wobbling out from under the shadow of the house, meowing, and stumbling forward. There was no sign of the mother cat. I must have gone to that window about a dozen times that morning and watched the wounded kitten make a broken progress across the lawn. I was tempted to go and deposit it at the door of the coal shed, but there was no leaving the house, my mother's orders. Some crazy fellow was shooting illegally in the orange grove. The police had been called. Sometime before lunch the shooting stopped. I looked out the window of the laundry room. The kitten was gone. That night I woke with a start in the claws of a bad dream I could not remember. In those days we slept with mosquito nets strung from four poles at each corner of the bed. Everything in the dark assumed a spectral appearance through white netting, a ghostly bureau, a ghostly toy box, ghostly curtains. That night, sitting at the foot of my bed, poking her face in so that the gauzy net was molded to her features like an awful death mask, was the black mother cat. I froze with terror. She glared at me with fluorescent eyes. She let out soft, moaning meows. I closed my eyes and opened them again. She sat there, wailing until dawn. Then I saw her rise, leap, and land with a thud on the floor and trot down the hall and down the stairs. The next morning in tears I told my mother of the cat that haunted my bedside all night. Impossible, she said and to prove it, we went through the house, inspecting latches and windows. Possible, mommy said when we found a window left opened in the laundry room. That new washerwoman, Nivea, was almost as bad as the old one, mommy complained. Impossibly the next night for the windows were locked and the house secure as an arsenal the cat appeared again at my bedside. And night after night after that. Sometimes she meowed. Sometimes she just stared. Sometimes I cried out and woke the house up. A face, mommy said, worried. A perfectly normal nightmare phase. The phase lasted. I gave the drum away to a little cousin, throwing the ghost cat into the bargain. But the cat came back, on and off, for years. Then we moved to the United States. The cat disappeared altogether. I saw snow. I solved the riddle of an outdoors made mostly of concrete in New York. My grandmother grew so old she could not remember who she was. I went away to school. I read books. You understand I am collapsing all time now so that it fits in what's left in the hollow of my story? I began to write, the story of Pila, the story of my grandmother. I never saw Swartz again. The man with the goatee and Koshtanka. Vanished from the face of creation. I grew up, a curious woman, a woman of story ghosts and story devils, a woman prone to bad dreams and bad insomnia. There are still times I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and peer into the darkness. At that hour and in that loneliness, I hear her, a black furred thing lurking in the corners of my life, her magenta mouth opening, wailing over some violation that lies at the center of my art.